All right, so for this set, of uh, this set of slides, I'm going to finally introduce some algorithms for reinforcement learning. So I know you guys have been waiting for this, right? And, and obviously I did introduce reinforcement learning in the first lecture, but we haven't quite seen algorithms specifically for reinforcement learning. So this is it, we're starting now. Okay, so um, I explained that reinforcement learning, the foundation, are Markov decision processes. And if you recall, so far what we've been working with are Markov decision processes that include a set of states, actions, and rewards. Then there's a transition and a reward model. There's a discount factor, and then there's a horizon. Right? So formally, this is a Markov decision process as we've discussed it in the previous lectures. There's one slight difference that I've done that I've introduced in this slide is that now here for the reward model, I'm just going to be slightly more general than before and then assume here that the rewards can be stochastic. Right? So previous lectures, I had here a reward function that was deterministic, meaning that for a specific state action pair, there was one reward that would be returned by the environment necessarily. So here I'm going to relax this and allow it to be stochastic. So that's the main difference, but otherwise everything else is the same. Okay, and then we saw that if we have all of this, right, then we can define a problem, which is to find an optimal policy pi star, and then it corresponds to maximizing the discounted sum of expected reward. And here you'll notice that I have an expectation um, that has to do with the fact that now I allow my rewards to be stochastic. So I'm going to take an expectation with respect to that distribution, but also an expectation with respect to the policy pi. Right? So, so in general, here the goal is to find a policy that will maximize the rewards. So I'm looking for pi star that maximizes this, this discounted sum. Okay, so that's what we, we've seen. But now let's go back to the picture that describes what is really reinforcement learning about. Right? So we saw that in reinforcement learning we have an agent, that's our computer, and then it will select some actions, they influence the environment, and then in the return the environment will provide some information about the state and also the reward. Okay, so this can be formalized by a Markov decision process where you see the policy would decide which action the agent chooses and then the transition and the reward model would decide what is the state and what is the, the reward that would be um, achieved at, at every step. Okay, now in reinforcement learning, the thing is we don't know necessarily what is the, uh, the model for the states and the rewards that the environment uses. Okay, so that's the main difference. But otherwise, the problem is the same. We're going to try to choose actions that maximize the rewards, just that we're not sure or we might not have much information about how the state and the reward is computed by the environment. OK, so formally, we can define reinforcement learning as follows. So it's the same thing as a Markov decision process, but where we remove the transition and the reward model. Okay, so, so from that perspective, it's, a, it's obviously a harder problem right? because we don't have that information. And then it's, you can even ask, well, can we even solve that problem? The answer is going to be yes, obviously, because for the rest of the course, we're going to discuss algorithms to achieve this. Um, but then it was useful to see some um, uh, decision theoretic planning algorithms that exploit a transition and a reward model when they're known, but now we're not going to know those models and still we're going to ask, can we find a policy that maximizes the discounted sum of expected rewards? Okay, so in the context of Markov decision processes, we solve that problem by finding an optimal policy given the transition and the reward model. And then once we had that policy, then we were able to just execute it. Okay? In the context of reinforcement learning, we're going to essentially learn an optimal policy while interacting with the environment. So the intuition is that even though we don't have the transition and the reward model, 
we're going to observe what are the states, actions, and rewards at every step. And then this gives us samples effectively from these unknown models. And then uh, in, in the limit, when you have a large sample, presumably uh, there's enough information in there that could allow us to recover what was the model, or otherwise even better, to come up with a policy that would be optimal with respect to that, the, these unknown models. So that's the intuition that even though we don't know the models, right, then um, here we're going to have samples of those that come from the fact that at every step, right, we observe a state and we observe a reward. And those samples give us some information and that information is going to be sufficient in the long run to allow us to find a good policy. Yeah. Ah, very good question. Yeah, is this system still fully observable? So yes, yeah, so at this point, I'm still making the assumption that the environment is fully observable. In other words, I get to observe what is the, uh, the state of the environment, so the full description that matters for me to take actions and, and also predict what will happen in the future. But then later in the course, we're going to relax this, and then we're going to consider as well partially observable uh, environments. Okay. All right, so as a concrete example, let's uh, look at um, a simple task here. Well, let's say we've got a little cart, and then uh, there's a stick. This stick is attached by a joint here, and then due to gravity, the stick might just fall uh, on one side or the other. Okay, and then for this task, the problem will be, can we control the cart, in other words, um, move it to the right or to the left in such a way where the pole will remain balanced. Okay, so it's a simple task. And then if you were not taking this course and did not know anything about reinforcement learning, what might be natural to do is to say, all right, this is not complex. Let's just look at the physics behind this, right? So I've got a, a cart and then the pole presumably has a certain size, a certain weight. Uh, when, when it's attached and, and then it falls, it will fall based on gravity. So gravity is a force and then I could measure perhaps how quickly it, 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 it will fall. And then when I push it um, on the right or the side, uh, sorry, on, on the right or the left, then uh, this is a force as well and I could study what will be the effect on the cart as well as the pole and so on. Right? So I could study uh, and, and try to write down lots of equations that would describe everything that matters based on physics. And, and in theory, we, we can do that, right? Um, and then we could solve this problem. So this problem is fairly simple. So we, we should be able to do it based on, on the knowledge that we have from, from physics. Uh, on the other hand, I mean, this does require quite a bit of knowledge. Uh, so I would think that most people couldn't just write down uh, these equations naturally. And then on the other hand, as a human, if you just take a stick, right, and then you're just asked to balance it, right, then uh, you can practice and then over time you'll balance it. And when you do this balancing, you don't go to any class to learn about physics, you just practice, right? So now the question is, can we do the same thing with a computer? Right? So instead of writing down all the equations, can we simply get it to learn by reinforcement learning? And here you see what the agent is missing are essentially uh, the equations for the model. Right? So what we're saying is we would like the cart to move left and right in such a way where it will learn to balance the pole in the same way that you would do it just with a, your hand practicing. Right? So it's doable because Obviously, we do it, and, and then we don't need to know the equations for, from physics for that. Okay, so here we can model this as a reinforcement learning problem by saying that perhaps the state is described by the position of the cart um, as well as its velocity, and then the angle of the stick, and, and then its angular velocity. Okay, so simple description. And then the actions are going to be forces, so we can push the cart to the left or push it to the right. And then as a result, um, the pole will hopefully remain balanced or not. And then we can give 
the system a reward of one whenever the pole is still balanced and, and I get zero otherwise. Okay, so then the problem is to find a policy pi that will map our state definitions to some forces, which are the actions, in a way that will maximize the reward. So we want to keep the pole balanced forever. And, and this is something that can be solved uh, by reinforcement learning, uh, just um, uh, by observing what, what happens when you try different actions. Okay, any questions regarding this? Very good. Okay, so now let's uh, talk a bit more in details about how we're going to design agents to do reinforcement learning. And it turns out that most agents will have some combinations of three important components. Some agents are going to learn a model explicitly. So they're going to be model-based um, agents. And then, so here when I talk about model, again, it means the transition dynamics as well as the, the reward um, distribution. Some agents are also going to explicitly model a policy. So that's um, the choices that the agents make in, in different states. And then some agents are also going to explicitly write uh, the value functions. So uh, this is, again, simply the expected total uh, sum of the rewards. OK, and based on those three components, we're going to see different algorithms that can be categorized as follows. So on, on the left side here, we've got value-based techniques that are going to represent explicitly the value function, but are not going to represent any policy explicitly. Now that might be a little weird because ultimately the goal is to find a policy. So how can we have an algorithm that has no policy? The intuition is that if you have a value function, we saw earlier that we can always induce a policy just by taking one step of, of value iteration and, and then uh, noticing what is the action that maximizes uh, that, that step. Right? So, so that's how we can get away without having a policy. Uh, some other algorithms is going to be the other way around. They're going to have a policy, but no value function. And then that too is going to be a little weird because you might say, well, how can I improve my policy if I don't even know its value, right? And, and here, um, in reinforcement learning, even if you don't have the value function, well, when you execute the policy, the environment will give you some rewards. And those rewards are essentially what you would normally use to compute the value function, but you could use them directly to adjust your policy. So at some level, we don't have to necessarily compute a value function. And then we're going to see some algorithms that work with a policy explicitly, but do not compute a value function explicitly. They simply use the rewards directly. OK, and then there are other algorithms that will use both. They're going to have a policy explicitly and a value function explicitly. These are known as actor critiques. And the name comes from the fact that um, if you have a policy, it means that you have, I guess, an actor. So um, the agent, when it acts, it is an actor, and then it, it, it chooses actions based on its policy. And then critique means that we have a value function that tells us how good that policy is. Right? So if we're critiquing our policy, it means that perhaps we're evaluating uh, how good it is. OK, so this is one way of ca characterizing the algorithms, and we're going to see uh, algorithms in, in, in each type. Uh, but then another way is to look at whether the algorithm is model-based or model-free. So we saw, again, that some an important component is, is the notion of a model. And in fact, the, the main problem in, in reinforcement learning is that we don't know what the model is. Right? So the agent is in some environment. It gets uh, states and, and rewards but it does not necessarily have the transition model as well as the reward model. But then some agents are going to be model-based because what they're going to do is to learn explicitly um, a representation for the transition and the reward model. And, and then this should be natural because if, 
in fact, if this is what we're missing, presumably this is what we should be doing, right? Maybe we, we can think of reinforcement learning as mostly just being, let's learn what's missing. So let's learn the transition and the reward model. And then once we've got that, then we already know through uh, the algorithms we discussed, so value iteration and policy iteration, how to optimize a policy given a model, right? But it turns out that we can also define algorithms that are model free. And then here, okay, we don't know what the model of the environment is, and we're not going to represent it explicitly. And the idea is that we're going to have uh, either a policy or value function, and then at every step we get some reward, and then we can um, simply adjust our policy or our value function estimate based on, on those rewards without ever representing the, the transition and, and the reward model. The intuition again is that we get samples from those at every step and if we can work directly with the samples then we don't need to have a model. Okay, so, so um, there will be several techniques um, that are different combinations and it turns out that in practice what has been uh, by far the most popular is to be model free because if you don't have a model then it's uh, less complex to, to, uh, to define. And, and then so in terms of uh, designing an algorithm, then it will be simpler. And then um, typically as well, the value-based techniques have been historically very popular because uh, you can define algorithms that mimic value iteration, which is this one line iteration, right? So it's very simple. So, so in fact, what we're going to do now is I'll tell you about one algorithm, well, actually a few algorithms that are going to be model-free and value-based, but then as the course progresses, we're going to see as well model-based techniques, policy-based techniques, and, and actor critiques. Okay, so to illustrate, let's consider a toy maze problem. So here, this is a little scenario where we've got an agent, and let's say the agent starts in state 1-1, one, one. so that's this corner here, and then um, it needs to reach some state, um, hopefully the upper right corner here where it can get a reward of plus one, but it might fall into a trap as well where it gets a reward of minus one, okay? So um, the, these two states are terminal, so you get plus one or minus one, and then uh, let's assume here that there's no discount, and also let's consider um, a reward that would be minus 0 0.04 for all the other non-terminal states. So like being here, 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 or here, all of these other states, let's say that there's a reward of minus 0 0.04. And here the intuition for this reward is just that um, it, it could correspond to, I guess, a small cost for taking some step, maybe burning some energy and, 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 and so on, so consuming some energy. Um, and then, yeah, so I, I guess we would like the, uh, the agent then to reach the plus one and to do this as quickly as possible. That's the intuition. Um, now in this environment, we're gonna have four actions. So the agent could go up, could go down, could go left, could go right. And uh, the problem is that we don't know the transition probabilities. So when we tell the agent to go up, it might in fact slip and then go right instead. Okay, so here, think that these four actions, up, left, right, and down, or names that we give to the actions that suggest perhaps a, a desired outcome that we would like the agent to really go up. But in reality, it could be just like in a mobile robot where you give a command for the robot to go in some direction. And then maybe the robot has one wheel on the carpet, another wheel that's off the carpet, and then the wheel on the carpet is spinning, the other one is not, and then it ends up turning, and then it goes into a different direction as a result. Okay, so that's uh, uh, essentially the, the, the background if you want, that um, here, even though we expect certain results, what might happen in practice could be different, and then there's some transition properties for that, but we just don't know what they are. Yes? So there's some stochasticity and there's some probabilities that we don't know, but if I take the up action, am I implicitly assuming that the probability that I'm gonna go up is higher than the probability of any other direction? Or am I not assuming that at all? So at least the way I've defined this here, we're not even assuming that at all. Okay, so but okay, in practice, down, right, 
they are literally just one, two, three, four, and they could be anything? That's right. So yeah, so here, yeah, the, these are just labels. They, they, they could mean anything. And then, um, yeah, it, it's not necessarily the case that when we say go up, that there's a higher probability we're going to go up. I mean, in practice, yeah, it, it will usually so be the case. No information <laughs> yeah, we have no information. At least that's the way I've described it. But if you have some a priori information, then you might want to utilize that. But this will become an interesting mostly in model-based reinforcement learning techniques because then you'll be able to perhaps constrain the, 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 those probabilities. In a model-free technique, this is a type of information, prior information, that you might not be able to use. Okay, so um, now let's start with a simple question of what is the value of being in a certain state where here, let's say that I execute the policy that I've written in the maze. So this policy says that if I'm in that state, I'm going to execute the action up. If I'm in this one, I'm going to execute left. And if I'm here, I'm going to execute right. And, and then so, okay, intuitively, right, what should happen is that if I start here and then I, and then my actions succeed in the sense that I really go up and then up and then right and then right, then I would end up at plus one, right? And then you could imagine that also part of the reason why when I start here, it's left, it's because I, I want to avoid the minus one. So ideally, I want to go around uh, to, to get to the plus one. And then here, perhaps, I'm, I want to go left again because if I go up instead, there might be a chance that I'll slip into the trap and get a minus one. So, so that, that would be the intuition for why I might want to follow a policy that goes all around. Okay, But in any case, this is a policy. And we'd like to know what is the value of this policy. Okay, So, so then um, let's see some ways in which we can evaluate this policy. So this is going to be uh, now model-free value-based reinforcement learning. OK, so we're going to start by just evaluating. So it's, it's model-free evaluation. And so I'm given a policy pi, and I want to evaluate v pi of s. And here, I do not know the transition model, and I do not know the reward model. Okay, so the agent doesn't know. So a first approach could be what is known as Monte Carlo evaluation. So we know in theory that the value at state s can be estimated by taking the expectation with respect to pi of the discounted sum of the rewards obtained at every time step. So now if I don't have um, the, the distribution for me to compute this expectation precisely, right? because I, I, I don't have the transition model, I don't have the reward model, but instead I obtain samples, then what I can do is simply um, do a sample approximation where I can replace the expectation by an average. Okay, So I'm going to take an average. So I'm going to do several runs. So I'm going to start in my state S and then execute uh, a sequence of actions according to my policy pi and just observe what are the rewards that I obtain. Okay? And I'm going to add up those rewards multiplied by the discount factor. And in each one of them, this discounted sum for one trajectory right, is going to be a sample. And then I'm going to take an average of several samples and this will be my estimate. Right? So, so this is a simple way of estimating the value of a policy pi without knowing the transition or the reward model. OK, and another approach could be that now, instead of using this equation, we've also seen the equation for policy evaluation, where normally the value of policy pi is the expected immediate reward plus the discount factor times an expectation with respect to future rewards. Now, I don't have the distributions to compute this expectation as well as this one, but instead I have samples. So what I could do, in this case it will be a one sample approximation, so I can replace my expectation by just one sample r, and then I can also replace this expectation with respect to future rewards by just one sample. 
So for future rewards, it depends what S prime I would obtain. And then the environment tells me at the next step what state I end up in. So then let me simply plug in V pi of S prime as one sample of this expectation. Okay. All right, so these are going to be two very uh, important methods, and we're going to have lots of variants based on that. Uh, but uh, these are two basic techniques, and then they come from, you see, our two definitions that we've seen. The one that says rewards are just added up, and then this one here that's uh, recursive um, that we obtain through dynamic programming, um, and then will give us a different type of, of estimate. Okay, so let's look more carefully at the Monte Carlo evaluation technique. So here I'm going to define GK to be just one trajectory um, of the Monte Carlo target. So what I mean by one trajectory is that I'm, I'm in the maze and I'm going to execute um, one, uh, I'm going to execute the policy once, just going uh, through the maze until I reach a terminal state. So either uh, the plus one or the minus one state. So let's just go back. Um, so here's our maze. I start, let's say, in this state here, and now I'm going to execute my policy and then simply observe what are the rewards that I obtain. Okay, and then just to make it concrete, let's uh, write down an example here. Okay, so I start in 1-1, one, one. then uh, I execute the action up, and then in this case, let's say that I end up after that into 1-2. One, 1-2 two. Uh, after this, 1-3, then 1-2, then 1-3, then 2-3, 3-3, and finally, 4, 3. Okay. So this is one sequence, right? And then you'll notice that in that sequence, you see I visit 1, 2. Um, then after that, I go to 1, 3. But then when I execute to right, I slip and then I get back down to 1, 2. That's why we've got 1, 2 again here. And then I go back up to 1, 3. And then after this, I go to uh, the terminal state plus 1. Okay, so this is an example. And now, in terms of rewards, right, so this would give me minus 0.04, this is minus 0.04, and so on. And then the last one is plus one. Okay, so now if I add up all of this, and here, uh, let's say that I've got a discount factor that is one, so that means no discount. This is just to keep things simple, all right? So then I would just add up all of those rewards. So I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, so this will be equal. Uh, so I guess the, the estimate G, um, so this will be for my first run. It will be equal to uh, one minus 0 0.28, so that's, uh, uh, 0.72, okay? All right, now I could do a second run. Um, this one also starts at 1, 1, then I've got 1, 2, then 1, 3, then 2, 3, then 3, 3, then 3, 2, 3, 3, and finally 4, 3. So same idea, I'm going to have minus 0.04 at each one of them. And plus 1 here. So now G uh, for the second run will also be 0.72. Okay, and let's do one last example. So let's say on the third run, um, I go to the following states. OK, 
Okay, so this one is a little different. So I start in 1, 1. I execute again up, but I slip and I end up into 2, 1. Then when I execute left, I slip again, I end up into 3, 1. And then after that, I slip again, I end up into 3, 2. And then I slip again, I end up into 4, 2. So this is a pretty bad run. So I ended up doing this, right? And I end up getting minus 1 for the last state. And then there's minus 0 0.04 for all the other states. <clears throat> OK, so then for this one, so G3 will be equal to minus 1.16. OK, so you see these are three estimates, uh, three samples of the total reward when I execute this policy. And then so according to our first algorithm, right, what we would do is then I would have a, a GK um, that corresponds to each run. So here uh, G, G1 is for the first run, G2 the second run, and G3 the, second, uh, the third run. So for each one of them, I've got a GK. And then I approximate my value function as follows. So, so then um, I will have several runs. I just add them up together, take the average. But now if I want to have a running average, something that I can update gradually, then what I do is I can uh, rewrite this expression as being my previous estimate plus 1 divided by the number of trajectories times the difference between one sample and my current estimate. Okay. So this is just a small derivation that shows how you can update and average one sample at a time. Okay, so this leads to now the following incremental update. So after you see each trajectory, so after the first trajectory, I get an estimate that's 0.72. But then after the second trajectory, I'd like to update my estimate of the value function. And then, so this will be the general form. So I will have an estimate, and then I update it by taking a step into the direction of the difference between my next sample minus um, the previous estimate. Okay, so, so here gn is, is a sample, it's, it's a target, and then alpha n is going to be the learning rate, which in this case corresponds to um, 1 divided by the number of, of trajectories that, that I've uh, gone through so far. Okay, so this should not be too complicated, but are there any questions? Yes? So here we don't assess individual actions, but we kind of evaluate the full trajectory. Right? Yeah, so in this algorithm, this Monte Carlo evaluation algorithm, the idea is that I'm going to take an entire trajectory to produce one sample, because the value function is the sum of all the rewards that I expect to get when I do an entire trajectory. Right? So that's why here I consider entire trajectories. Um, and, and then I guess what you're getting at is the fact that, okay, this, this is going to be um, quite expensive because I have to wait till I complete an entire trajectory before I get a sample. Okay, so this is why we have then another algorithm known as temporal difference evaluation. And this one, um, again uses this approximation where the value function is roughly equal to the current reward plus gamma times uh, the future reward. And here, if you recall, it's because we have uh, one sample from our reward model, and then we have one sample S prime from our transition model. So this is, this is roughly a one sample approximation. Now, we can use this and rewrite it as an incremental update as well. Um, so if I manipulate this equation, right, then I can write it in a way where I will have a target, um, which is the one sample estimate. So that's what I have here. And then I can take the difference between this target and my previous estimate, and now make a step in the direction of that change to update my previous estimate. 
Okay, so often when we are updating estimates, right, we like to simply take some step in some direction, and then we're going to see multiple algorithms that follow this pattern where we're taking a step in some direction, and here the, the direction is going to be defined often by the difference between some target and um, our, our current estimate. Okay, so now this algorithm is known as temporal difference evaluation because if you look at this equation, right, this is the difference between the, my previous estimate and now my new estimate when I do one more step in, 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 in terms of executing an action. Um, so there's a temporal difference because it would be the estimate at a certain time step and this is the estimate at the next time step. Okay, so, so here we're essentially um, trying to minimize the difference between um, the temporal evaluation. So that's why it's called temporal difference, so TD. Um, and then a lot of algorithms we're going to see are, are often called TD type updates. Okay, so this algorithm, um, if we choose alpha n, which is the uh, the size of the step or the learning rate, if we choose it appropriately uh, by essentially decreasing it um, fast enough but not too fast, then it will converge to the correct value. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so our, our, our value function v pi uh, will essentially uh, converge to the correct value for the policy. Um, so this will hold as long as we have the following, um, well, we can prove this if we have a schedule for the learning rate alpha to decrease at a certain rate. And so some sufficient conditions are that if I add up all the learning rates at every step and then that sum goes to infinity, but also if I add up the square of the learning rate and this remains finite, then I can show that this will converge uh, to the correct value for the value function. The intuition here is that um, with this sum going to infinity, it's essentially saying that alpha n is decreasing, but it's not decreasing too fast, so I will keep on learning. Right? So if alpha n is zero, then it means that I don't care even if I make a mistake here and then I would not do any update. I would stop learning. So I need an alpha n that is not zero, right? And then here this ensures that at every step alpha n is going to be uh, greater than zero because I mean if, if these alpha n's were all becoming zero then at some point the sum would stop growing and then it would be bounded, right? But if it's not bounded then it means that these alpha n's are all greater than zero, so I keep learning, so I will always update based on, on this. Uh, but at the same time, when I update all the time, right, I need to start converging. Right? I cannot do updates just based on one sample in different directions, because then I will be more or less oscillating or doing a bit of a random walk around my um, converging point. So I need to essentially reduce the size of, of those steps. And then this says here that the steps, even though they're all greater than zero, they're getting closer and closer to zero fast enough that uh, here I, I will end up converging. So that's the intuition. Um, and, and then, uh, so yeah, so I don't have the proof here. Uh, but this is known as a robbins monroe scheme, and then so it's based on the theory of stochastic approximation, and then uh, you, you can look this up, but in any case, um, the intuition here should be sufficient for, for you to understand why this should work. Any questions? Yes? So you're asking if AS is the same as, I, I don't see any AS here. N S. Oh, N S. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So that's um, the number of times that S is visited. Okay. And yes, it is the same as in the previous slide. So if I go back. Um, so yeah. So here too, N S was the number of times that I visit uh, a state. 
So it turns out that yeah, if you simply use as a learning rate, one divided by um, ns, so the number of times you visited that state, it will give you a schedule that you can um, prove mathematically will ensure convergence. Is the number of times that I visit that state. Yeah, so in, in this case, it will correspond to the number of samples. Okay. Um, and, and then in this case, too, it will correspond to the number of times that I visit this, uh, this state. Okay, so here, samples are different, right? So here, a sample is just. Um, one action with one state, right? So, or actually, no, I, I should say it's a state action state triple. So this gives me a sample that allows me to do this update, okay? But now I want to count how many times I am in state S, and then I select an action and I end up into another state, right? So because each time I am in that state S, I'm going to update my estimate for the value function, okay? And here, a sample is just this triple. In the previous slide, uh, we are, we're also counting how many times we visit state S, but then a sample required to look at the entire trajectory till the end. Okay, so as a result, this algorithm is going to be more sample efficient most of the time because um, like what is considered a sample is just a triple as opposed to an entire trajectory. So I'm going to be able to update um, my estimates faster. And the intuition is that really this is based on the value iteration algorithm, which does dynamic programming. Okay. Um, right, so here I have one sample, but I guess what I'm going to do is just keep track of how many times I visited that state. Okay, so I'm going to keep a counter ns for every state, and then when I get to s again, I have that counter, and then I can set alpha appropriately to be 1 divided by ns. Yeah, so they are the same. Yeah. Okay, so here's the algorithm for temporal difference evaluation. So here we would repeat this loop where at every iteration, we execute an action according to our policy pi. Uh, we observe a state S prime as well as a reward. And now we update our counts. So this is what we we're just discussing, ns. Right? So we're going to update the counts ns. That gives us the learning rate. And then we can apply our update equation. So we look at the temporal difference. So that's the difference between our current estimate and our new estimate. And then simply take a step in that direction, which gives us a revised estimate. Um, and then we would update S and then repeat. Right? So, so then we would do this after every um, execution of an action and observing what the next state is. Yes. Uh, does changing the learning rate and make the estimate to be biased in some way? Absolutely. So yeah, so here, okay, yeah, the, the, that's an interesting question. So what about the bias? Because here um, I'm relying on my previous estimate to update uh, my current estimate, right? So the way this algorithm works is that I'm going to update v pi of s based on v pi of s prime. And maybe v pi of s prime is inaccurate, right? So I get one sample. So yes, it's one sample that I can use to update this. But then that sample is assuming that I have now a correct value for v pi of s prime. And it might not be correct. So it turns out that um, in the long run, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it's going to converge to the right thing. But if you stop at any point in time, so if you don't have an infinite number of samples, right, then your estimate will be biased. Um, and, and that comes from, from this. And now the learning rate also matters because the learning rate will adjust how quickly we make steps in, in this direction. So at the beginning, we make big steps because we, we, we're just starting and then we need to adjust a lot. 
And then as we uh, get more and more data, we want to make smaller and smaller and smaller steps so that uh, we can really converge. And, and then so as a result here, um, this will be a bias estimate, whereas the previous algorithm, the Monte Carlo evaluation technique, was unbiased. OK, so to summarize, so we've seen two algorithms. The first one, Monte Carlo evaluation, as I just explained, it's an unbiased estimate, but it has as a drawback that it has high variance and it needs many trajectories, right? Because one sample in that algorithm is an entire trajectory. Um, so this has a benefit that the estimate is going to be unbiased because I'm really just taking an average of, of the values of all my trajectories. So that's, that's, sh that's fairly clear that it's going to be unbiased. But on the other hand, because I will have very few of those samples that requires an entire trajectory for each sample, then I will typically have high variance because my sample size is typically going to be small. Um, yeah, so, so this is, uh, these are the main things. Uh, now for the temporal difference evaluation, it's the other way around. So this one has a bias estimate. So we, um, again, that's because we're bootstrapping. So, so we're um, leveraging the fact that we have an estimate for another state S prime that we're using when we do our update. Um, the advantage is that because we leverage uh, this other estimate, then it's, it's, um, it's a form of dynamic programming. We're essentially sharing between different trajectories the information. And, and then so we're going to lead less trajectories. And, and then a, a sample here is really a triple. So it's not an entire trajectory. Right? So we're updating more frequently. So in general, we're going to have lower variance. So there's going to be a, a trade-off between those two. OK, so in practice, this tends to be um, the approach that is used most often because it's, it's simply more efficient. But in some situations, we'll, this will still be very important. OK. Um, all right, so let's stop here. And then I'm going to finish up those slides next class. OK, so now we can talk about how we can also update a policy. Uh, so we're going to call this model-free control. Um, and again, we do not know what is the, the model, but instead we have some samples from the environment that are going to guide us. OK, so um, in general, um, if we want to do control, what we can do is estimate a Q function. And then based on the Q function, simply uh, pick the action that will be the maximal one. So here, a Q function is going to be very similar to a regular value function. Um, it's essentially a, a value function, but with respect to state action pairs. Because if I only have a value function with respect to states, then it tells me how good it is to be in a certain state when I execute my policy. But I, I don't know how I could update that, so what might be the best action. And then so a Q function is going to be very similar to a value function V, but with the difference that now we parameterize it by a state action pair. And then so here we're going to define the Q function as the value of executing action A followed by policy pi. In contrast, the value function was the value of just executing the policy pi. So you would execute that policy at every step. But here, we're going to allow the first action to be different than, than the one prescribed by policy pi. So we're going to consider different actions. So that's why we've got A as a parameter. And then after that, we're going to follow pi. So we can define the Q function in a very similar way as the value function, where the main difference is that you see here the reward is conditioned on, on the action. And then we're going to consider all the possible actions. And we do not necessarily take the maximal action or the action prescribed by a policy. We want to consider all possible actions. And now, based on the Q function, if we want to know what might be a, a good way to improve to select a better action, then we simply compare the Q values for different actions. Okay, so, 
So this new type of function, the Q function, is going to be very useful for policy improvement because then it, it tells us what is the value of starting in some state, executing different possible actions, and then following the policy pi afterwards. And then so if we want to improve pi, then perhaps we can just change that first action and then consider the action here that would give us the highest Q value. Okay, so based on this, now we can define um, Bellman's equation, but with respect to Q function. So I've got here as a recap, the regular Bellman equation uh, that tells us what is the optimal value function. So that is normally the sum of the rewards discounted with respect to executing the best actions possible. And then we can write this recursively by saying that it's going to be the reward, the immediate reward that is best when I maximize with respect to A, plus uh, the discounted sum of future rewards, where again here I want to consider the best future reward, so that's why I've got V star. Okay? And Bellman's equation is essentially a fixed point, so V star is going to be um, unique, and here um, it, it will be the best possible value function that can be achieved by any policy. Now, again, if I don't have necessarily the best policy or the best value function, what I'd like to do is, is consider uh, different possible actions at the start. So that's why I will rewrite this value function in terms of Q function. And, and then so here, uh, this equation can be rewritten in this way, where at the beginning, instead of maximizing with respect to A, I simply consider all possible actions. And then after that, if I want to follow the optimal policy after the first action, then what I would do is take my expectation with respect to what would be the best uh, in the future. And then the best in the future is to maximize with respect to A prime. So this would be the second action that we would execute. And then after that, follow whatever um, is the best. So, so the, the optimal policy pi star. So in general here, whenever I use star, it means that it's the optimal policy or the optimal value function or the optimal Q function. Um, and, and then so now this gives us another equation that is mathematically equivalent. And, and you can see that at least synthetically, the main difference is that I move the max that was at the beginning here towards the end of the equation. But um, that doesn't change the mathematics, really. You, you should be able to convince yourself that these are equivalent. Okay? And, and then this equivalence, in fact, follows from the fact that V star of S is really equal to the max of all the Q star S A when I choose the best action A. And then I can also extract my optimal policy simply by comparing the Q values for different actions. So even though the value function really should just depend on, on the state, uh, here, because we want to be able to improve policies, then again, we're going to consider this variant known as a Q function that is parameterized in terms of both S and A. And then this is going to be extremely useful for us to do policy improvement because then we'll be able to always see what is the impact of, of that first action. And if I want to change or improve that first action, then I just compare the Q values. Any questions regarding this? Yes. Do we still know transitional probabilities and expectation on rewards? Right. OK, so yeah, so here we still know transition probabilities and also the uh, reward probability. So what I've done here is just introduce the mathematics of this uh, new function. And now we're going to see how we can use that um, via some samples. So we're going to, uh, I guess, relax the fact that, um, well, we're, we're going to go along with the fact that we don't know the, the model and simply get some samples. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah, so no, they, they are equivalent. So you can go from the first to the second or from the second to the first. But you're right, it's always under the assumption that here um, um, we, we define V star to be equal to the max of Q star S and A. Okay. Yes,
from the first one. Okay, well, so here, um, if I simply, well, I, okay, based on, on this identity, right, I can clearly replace max of Q star S and A by V star of S prime, right? So, so this is the same as that, right? And now, let me finish. So on, on the left-hand side, here I can introduce a max over um, A, and then it will be equivalent. Yeah. Well, I, 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 okay. How how do I get the second one from the first one? Um, well, okay. Again, I, I can go this way simply because uh, these are uh, equal, right? And then here I can rewrite v star according to this as a max, right? And um, then I will I will end up with this. So I guess maybe the problem is that you'd like to see a max in front here, right? So, um, right, so I guess here, um, yeah, if, okay, you, I, I guess yeah, there, there are some details in, in terms of, yeah, if we want to really make this totally equal to this, I, I guess what I meant is that they are equivalent, or at least you can make them equal, but under the assumption that, yeah, you introduce a max in front here. Yeah, okay, good. Okay, let's keep going. So now we can use this notion of Q function to do control. And in particular, what we can do here is alternate between policy evaluation and policy improvement, where what we can do is for policy evaluation, um, use um, a Monte Carlo estimate, where um, I'll, I'll simply use a G, as we saw last class, where this is going to be the sum of the initial reward, let's say produced by a certain action A, and then um, the sum of all the future rewards after that according to policy pi. So I'm going to call this GKA, so that indicates that it's the sum of the rewards when I start with action A followed by policy pi, and then K simply indicates that this is uh, my, my kth trial, so it's going to be my kth sample. So now for policy evaluation, um, then I can use this incremental update where at every step, or I guess here at every trajectory, I get a new sample, so I get a new GA. So here I, I call it GAN. Uh, I guess now I've just um, uh, changed the index from K to N, but it's really the same thing. Uh, so this is a sample, and then I want to compare the sample to my current estimate, take the difference, and then make a step uh, that will correct based on that difference. Or if you recall, alpha n is simply here um, uh, a learning rate. Okay. So then each time I get a trajectory, I get a new GNA, and then I do this update, and then uh, this allows me to um, gradually evaluate my policy. Okay, so this is the Monte Carlo policy evaluation that we saw earlier. But now if I want to improve my policy, then the beauty of having now a Q estimate is that I know what's the value of different actions, and then I can simply change my policy to um, select the best action here. So it'll get a new policy pi prime, and then I can repeat uh, those two steps where now here I would replace pi in this uh, first step by pi prime, evaluate that again, and then improve after that, and, and so on. Okay, so this is a, um, a fairly simple approach. It's not the most uh, sample efficient technique, but it's a very simple way of leveraging what we've just seen so that we can improve um, the policy over time. Okay, what, what is more efficient, and in fact what tends to be used in practice, is to do temporal difference control. So here we approximate the Q function um, in the following way. So again, we've got here the Q function equation that corresponds to really Bellman's equation. Um, and then we can approximate it by saying that this expectation now, perhaps we approximate it by a single sample. And then 
the expectation with respect to future rewards, we're going to take a sample from this distribution, so we get a, a single S prime, and then we simply plug that in here, and then this gives us a one sample approximation to the Q function. Okay? Now, this is a one sample approximation, but we're going to get many samples over time, so, so each time we're going to update uh, gradually um, the, the, the Q function, and then the incremental update would look like this. So we take our target, right? So this is uh, uh, what comes from one sample, and then we compare it to our current estimate, measure the difference. This is known as the temporal difference because it's the difference between our current estimate and then the estimate that comes from having a sample for one time step. So we here look at the Re the immediate reward plus the sum of, of the future reward. So that's, that's the estimate we would get at the next time step. And then so this temporal difference then can be used to update the Q function. Okay, so we would um, repeatedly update the Q function in, in this manner. So we can put that together into an algorithm that is known as Q learning. So this is one of the most popular and also simplest algorithm in, in reinforcement learning. And the way the algorithm works is that we go through this loop where at every iteration we're going to execute an action, observe the next state S prime and then the reward R. Then we count how many times we've been in state S with action A. That that helps us define a learning rate. So we're going to take one divided by that count for the learning rate. And then we update the Q function according to the incremental update that we just saw. So it's a temporal difference update. And, and then we simply repeat. Okay? So as we execute some actions, right, then we're going to get samples. And then we can update our Q function in, in this manner. And then the idea is that uh, this will gradually improve. Any questions regarding the algorithm? Yes. Is this basically value iteration but expressed with Q instead of uh, value function? Ah, yes, very good point. So, yeah, so here you can think of Q learning as um, essentially a variant of value iteration where um, we're working with the Q function instead of the value function, but I mean, these things are equivalent. And then here, we just don't have a model, so we are sampling uh, based on trajectories instead of taking expectations. But it is essentially performing value iteration based on, on samples. Since we don't evaluate policy explicitly here, right? We don't compute I. That's right. So here, this approach um, uh, does not have any policy, so it's a value function based approach or a Q function based approach. Um, and it's also model free. So that's why this is one of the simplest approaches because if you recall when we categorize different reinforcement learning techniques, we said that some of them are model based, some of them are model free. This is model free. Some of them have um, a, a policy, others have a value function, some of them have both. This one does not have any explicit policy. All it has is a Q function. And the idea is that if you want to now use that to um, execute some action, so to induce a policy, then you would just look at the Q function and then for any state simply select the action that, that gives you the highest Q value. Okay. K to the N. So yeah, where, the which slide? Of, uh, one, one slide before. One slide before, okay. That's the, the steps of the iteration, and the k indicates that's the number of samples. So, how can we set the k directly? Right. Okay. So, so here, um, <coughs> yeah. So, uh, k is the number of samples, um, and then n here would be the number of iterations. Now, most of the time, k and n are going to be the same. So, so yeah. So here, perhaps I, I should have just use the same notation, I should have just used n in both cases. Yeah. Yes? Here we are using temporal difference evaluation plan for the learning algorithm. So in this algorithm, it's unbiased. So why can't we, why 
Um, so, so here we are not using Monte Carlo evaluation, or at least we're not using full trajectories to estimate the Q value directly. Uh, no, sorry. I guess, yeah, on this slide we are. Sorry, on this slide we are using Monte Carlo updates. Uh, but then for Q learning, um, what happens is that we're using the temporal difference. Yeah, so, so sorry, can you repeat your question then? Ah, yeah, so we could use um, Monte Carlo evaluation in this algorithm as well. Um, so I, I could have given you some pseudocode as well for, for this. It, it's just that in practice, um, this is rarely used. So what is typically used is, is the one based on temporal difference learning, because temporal difference learning tends to be much more efficient in terms of the number of samples required. So here, a sample. Is, is just a triple state, action, actually a quadruple, so state, action, reward, and next state. Um, whereas in, in Monte Carlo control or Monte Carlo evaluation, we need an entire trajectory. So here, we're exploiting the fact that we made the assumption that the process is Markovian, and as a result, right, we can simply break down our trajectories into small samples that correspond to, to just these quadruples of a state, an action, a reward, and the next state. And, and then so all of that gets shared, and implicitly this is doing value iteration, therefore dynamic programming, and, and then it will be much more sample efficient. There's only one caveat, which is that this is biased, and then if the Markovian assumption doesn't hold, then we might have some problems. Yes? Um, I noticed there is a select and execute A. Hmm. Is, that, uh, is that alpha or execution? Yeah, very good. Okay, so yeah, you're a few slides ahead. <laughs> yeah, so the question is how do we select and execute A? And we're, we're going to get to this in a moment. Okay, but first, let me just give you an example of how the Q learning algorithm would work. So here, let's say we've got a simple maze problem. Um, so there, there's a, a grid world. And, and then so uh, each cell corresponds to a different state. And then let's say that we've got actions that uh, could correspond to go right, to go down, to go left, or to go up. And then uh, we would like to um, estimate the Q values and improve the policy using Q learning. So in this case, um, let's say that we are in state one, and now we are taking the action right. And let's say that we ended up uh, in state two. Okay, so we are in state one, we execute the action go right, and we end up in state two. So the Q learning algorithm would update this Q value, which is represented here by 73, according to this equation. Just for the sake of uh, showing a few more values, uh, I've got the Q value here for S2 with the action right, so this would be 100. For the action going down is 81, and for the action going left is 66. Okay, So now we take the equation that we saw before, and then we simply plug in the numbers that we have here. So for S1 going right, the current estimate is 73. Then um, let's say that we have a learning rate of 0.5. So I'm just going to plug that in. And um, now let's see that we have no reward. So let's say the reward is 0 plus a discount factor of 0.9 max. And now we take the max of the Q values in state 2. So in state 2, you see we've got a Q value of 66 for left, another one of 81 for down, and 100 for right. So we take the max of that minus the Q value of S1 going right, so that's 73. So we just do the math, and we arrive at 81.5, which means that now we update uh, the value for um, going right, and, and now we end up in S2. Okay? Yes? So since we do this value of the of Q function, one would have to multiply the first term by 1 minus. Minus learning rate. 
Okay, so you're saying that uh, this corresponds to doing one minus the learning rate because I guess we've got Q here and then we also have Q here um, and then there's a minus sign. So yeah, so it does correspond to one minus the learning rate times Q. Because basically every step will take like weighted average of uh, like Q and the learning rate. Yeah, so Right, so yeah, so here the learning rate, the way you can think about it is that yes, it is taking a weighted combination of our current estimate and then the new target. And then all I've done here is rewrite this weighted combination in a way where it corresponds to saying, well, I've got an estimate and I'm going to make a correction to that estimate. But it is mathematically equivalent to saying we take a weighted combination. Yeah. Okay. All right, so let's come back to the Q learning pseudocode. So here, um, as was asked earlier, there's an important question about how do we select and execute the actions, right? Because we didn't define that. We, I just wrote here we're going to select some action, but we need to select it in, in a specific way. And now we're going to, uh, I, I guess, use various strategies for that. Yes? OK, so uh, this slide, yes? Oh, so yeah, so here I'm just showing uh, the relevant information in this picture. So we do have Q values for every state action pair, okay? So in the algorithm, right, you would have a table in which you would store all the Q values for every state action pair. Now in this picture, I just showed you those that are relevant for updating the Q value for S1 taking action right. So is it always uh, possible to have that distinct um, for, uh, for So if it is possible to have all the Q values, okay. So I guess yeah. What what you're probably asking then is uh, now what about uh, having a very large state space? What about having a continuous state space? Then we would not be able to enumerate and store in a table all the Q values, right? And then so. We're going to get to this in, um, I guess, by the end of this lecture, if there's enough time. Yeah. Uh, sorry, uh, I think that's the weak gas the um, uh, 81.5. And uh, uh, based on that's the way we set a previous value as a 73. And all the other three values, what if they are, all the other three values also need to be of modified? And they are in incorrect. Absolutely. So yeah, so here. Uh, the question is, yeah, how can we do an update from 73 to 81.5 that's based on other estimates that might be wrong, yeah. right? So we should probably update those first. And then, so the reality is that if you recall, the, the, uh, the, this Q value update, right, comes from the Bellman equation for the Q function. And, and then the idea is that in the limit, when you do enough updates, right, then uh, this should converge to... Um, the true optimal Q function. And, and then so the idea is that even though some of those estimates might be off, right, because they're just estimates, right, then in the limit by doing enough of those updates, right, they're going to converge to the right values. And this is why we spent some time earlier proving, for instance, that value iteration, when you start with some estimates for the value function that, that are off, it doesn't matter, right? It's always going to converge to the true optimal value function, uh, no matter where you start from. And here, this algorithm, the idea is that it is an approximation to value iteration, but it does share the same properties. And in fact, uh, you can prove here that as long as you have a learning rate that decreases at the right rate, um, then uh, this will converge. Yes. Um, when you say alpha is equal to 0 0.5, um, is it because it is the second time that you are in S1? Oh, no. So this was just for the sake of this example. So uh, there's no reason why I pick 0 0.5 over something else. OK, so here, um, yeah, I, I just wanted a, a simple number that would make the calculation easy, right? So 0 0.5, I just divide by 2. But if I, if I put 0 0.99, this might be a little harder, right? <laughs> <clears throat> okay. Is this a 
Right, okay, so here, um, yeah, that's a good question. So is this a convex problem? Because at some level we are optimizing a policy. Um, under the hood, again, this is really an approximation to doing value iteration. Uh, and then we saw in previous lectures that value iteration, policy iteration, do correspond to um, solving some convex optimization problem. Now here, the main difficulty is that we don't have the transition and the reward model. So then there's this approximation step. And, and, then, and then it's unclear whether it's going to converge, whether the problem has become non-convex and so on. But then uh, we're going to see in a moment again that with the right schedule for alpha, we will be able to uh, achieve convergence and, and to a global optima. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. So here you can initialize Q to anything and it will converge. So that's beautiful. Okay, one last question. Oh, <laughs> okay, two quick questions then. What's <laughs> our horizon? Is that finite or uh, okay, so in this case, I did not define it. This was just meant to be an example of one step, right? So if it's finite horizon, then um, it will work the same way as if it's infinite horizon here. Uh, and uh, does the learning rate influence our final result? Absolutely, yes. The learning rate will influence the final result. And then, yeah, let, let me just keep going because... Um, well, actually, okay, it's not in this set of slides, but the next set of slides, we'll, we'll talk about the convergence. And, and then here, we, we need to have the, the, the right schedule for, for convergence. Okay, but um, yeah, there's an important question here that I haven't addressed, which is how we select A. And then for this, there are many possibilities. But um, what's important is to realize that the choice of A can be done based on two different <coughs> principles. One principle could just be that, well, we want to uh, earn a, as much reward as possible, so let's, let's simply exploit what we know, and then let's simply select the action that is most promising at, at every step, okay? So this would correspond to exploitation. Um, the problem, though, is that uh, we don't have a model, or the model might not be perfect, and then this might lead to some optimal results. Um, another approach is to say, well, we better take some actions at random because then we're going to explore and then we're going to gain information by obtaining samples of various trajectories and, and then in the limit with exploration, then we're going to cover everything and then we'll be able to, uh, to, to, to find the optimal policy. Whereas in this case, when we exploit, it might be the case that in a state, we take an action um, that is normally optimal, but then because it's stochastic, we, we don't have good luck on, on one trial, and then we end up with a low reward. And then after this, we might say, well, this action doesn't look very promising anymore, so let's just focus on the other actions, and then the other actions give us high rewards, and then we just keep on executing <coughs> them, and then we never gain any information about the really, truly optimal action, and as a result, we might get stuck. So, so there is this problem, um, and, and then so we often need to balance between exploitation and exploration. Exploitation will usually give us higher rewards in the short term, but we might get stuck into a local optimum. And with exploration, um, here we are going to guarantee that we can um, uh, explore everything, obtain statistics um, that, that are um, necessary to estimate implicitly every part of our model and then obtain an optimal Q function and therefore converge to uh, the, the global optimal policy. Um, so, so yes, we need some exploration, but, but then there's a question of how much exploration and, and how to do it. Okay, so one very simple approach is just to say that at any step, I'm going to execute an action at random with some probability epsilon, and otherwise we're simply going to choose the action that is most promising according to the Q function. Okay, so, so this is a simple way of trading between exploration and exploitation. Right? So we're going to explore with a small probability epsilon and we're going to exploit uh, the rest of the time. 
Um, let me mention briefly an, another approach, um, which is known as Boltzmann's exploration. The idea is that um, we have here a probability of choosing any action according to this formula. And, and this formula is essentially um, the exponential of each Q function divided by some temperature T, where T is, is really just a parameter. Um, and, and then this is inspired by uh, some phenomena in, in nature, where if you have uh, lots of energy, then your temperature is high, and then there might be a lot of randomness. But then if your temperature is lower, then uh, there's, there's a lot less randomness. Things uh, tend to become deterministic. And, and, and here we can observe that indeed when T is high, we're going to have a probability that is generally going to be more uniform. And when T is low, this is going to be a much more skewed distribution where it might, in the limit, converge to simply choosing the action that has the highest Q value all the time. Okay? So this gives us a way of um, uh, having a continuum of, of distributions with respect to actions where we tend to prefer actions that have high Q values over those that have low Q values. Okay? All right, so when we do this, um, what's important is that we need to do enough exploration so that we can get information to estimate the Q values correctly and, and, and converge to the optimal Q values in, in the limit. And we can guarantee that this will happen um, at least under the following conditions. So these are sufficient conditions for a learning rate alpha. So here, um, yeah, so if we choose um, the learning rate in such a way where um, the sum becomes infinite, and then the sum of the learning rate squared is finite, then um, that in combination with, um, actually, sorry, so here this should not be the learning rate, but um, rather, I believe, epsilon. Let me just go back. Um, <clears throat> yeah, so if, we're, if we are considering uh, the case of epsilon greedy policy, where we're choosing an action at random with policy, uh, sorry, with probability epsilon, then the idea is that if we really want to converge, then in the limit, um, then we need to make sure that this probability decreases. Okay, and and then so yeah, there's a typo here on this slide. So um, I guess I should replace learning rate by uh, the probability of exploration epsilon, and and then so here we need to decrease this probability. Um, at a certain rate, and then this is similar to some of the proofs that we saw earlier about the learning rate, uh, where if the sum of the epsilons um, is infinite, uh, and then at the same time the sum of the epsilon squared are finite, then this will converge. Okay. Otherwise, um, what might happen is that the Q values will oscillate. Um, and then we, we will not get convergence. Okay. All right, so to summarize, here we talked about model-free value-based agents, and then I talked about two general approaches, one that is based on Monte Carlo sampling, the other one based on, on temporal difference learning. Um, and then this one is unbiased but requires lots of data. This one has low variance but um, gets away with less data. And then we can use both of these techniques. But then in addition, we need to be careful uh, where we're going to need to do some exploration. Um, and then there's a, this dilemma between exploitation and exploration. And we just talked about two simple approaches that will induce a certain amount of exploration.